So uh, welcome everybody. Welcome to our guest who's come from a distant land, <laughs> Princeton, New Jersey, but before that, uh, Tel Aviv. Um, Dr. Lina Salema. Beginnings, who's going to talk about the beginnings of Islamic law, late antique Islamic legal traditions, which is also the title of her book, <laughs> which is very convenient. <laughs> Well, it is a book talk, so yeah. I think that's the title. I know, but I mean, sometimes you can try and you know, do something, a different title. But this is uh, really good. People know exactly what they're, you know, what the subject of the talk is. So uh, welcome to Awi Matala Center for Muslim Christian Understanding. And um, uh, Lena is going to talk to about her, her work today. She's associate professor at Tel Aviv University Law School. Is that how it would be said? Tel Aviv Law School. Tel Aviv Law. Um, she researches and teaches Islamic and Jewish, juris, uh, Jewish jurisprudence in both historical and contemporary legal systems. Um, her book, Beginnings of Islamic Law, which came out in 2016, explores how a critical historiography can illuminate Islamic legal beginnings. She's published in Law and Legal and History Review, Law and Social Inquiry, Islamic Law and Society, Journal of Legal Education, UC Irvine Law Review, uh, Islam and Muslim Christian, and Christian Muslim Relations, and The Imminent Frame. She also writes and speaks in the politics of knowledge and pr production in Islamic studies. Uh, uh, she earned her PhD in legal and Middle Eastern history from UC Berkeley and her JD from Harvard Law School. So, no doubt above average intelligence, right? Um, I don't know what that means. She's a member of the California Bar as well, in case you have any outstanding tra traffic tickets from that part of the world, and she can help you out. Um, and her publications can be downloaded at Tel Aviv Academia.edu, Lena Salema. So welcome and uh, please enlighten us. <laughs> I'll try, we'll see. Can everyone hear me in the back? Okay, well thank you all for being here and uh, for taking the time out of your busy schedules. I was actually asked to speak about my book, The Beginnings of Islam, Late Antique Islamic Hate Legal Traditions. My book combines jurisprudence, history, philosophy of historiography, and critical theory in order to demonstrate that Islamic law began as a hybrid legal tradition and that it changed in response to sociopolitical and historical co conditions. I question dominant disciplinary methodologies, identify ideology in scholarly production, and resist the limitations of modern terms and concepts. These critical techniques minimize both anachronistic and prejudicial distortions, revealing that Islamic law, like any legal tradition, is always in a dialogical relationship with contemporaneous and predecessor legal traditions. I propose that Muslim jurists are like artists who use a combination of reused and new materials, crafting their legal opinions by fusing ancient norms, scripture, prophetic precedents, local practice, and contemporaneous needs in unexpected ways. The craft of Islamic legal recycling produced pieces or compositions whose component parts are not easily identifiable or classifiable. And so that's actually the point of the image on the right side of the slide. It's an example of recycled art, and it's intended to demonstrate that the aesthetic complexity of recycled art. <coughs> So put simply, my book is about the art of Islamic jurisprudence. The book has a bipartite structure. The odd number chapters delineate and analyze problematic assumptions in contemporary Islamic legal historiography, while the even number chapters apply these insights to specific case studies about legal re re rulings. Each of the three case studies in the book illustrates an example of the recycled art of Islamic jurisprudence. And in my talk today, I will extend three of the book's methodological critiques. So when I wrote my book, I was primarily concerned with analyzing conventional methodologies in contemporary Islamic studies scholarship and developing alternatives, which I will summarize in my presentation today. But after the book was published, I was asked to edit a volume on German imaginaries of the Orient and to contribute a chapter to that volume. And it was then that I began to read more deeply in recent scholarship about 19th century German Orientalism. And this scholarship, this recent scholarship, surprised me for two reasons. First, much of this scholarship claims that some German Orientalism was not imperialist, based primarily on scrutinizing the identity and intentions of 19th century German Orientalist scholars. And second, this scholarship makes these claims about German Orientalism without considering how German Orientalist scholarship shaped Islamic studies. So in my presentation today, I'm going to use the ideas from my book 
to contest this recent scholarship about 19th century European Orientalism. I will illustrate that we can only identify intellectual imperialism by examining scholarly methods rather than biographies or intentions. More importantly, that Islamic studies scholars are missing from current conversations about 19th century German Orientalism or European Orientalism more broadly is itself a reflection of intellectual imperialism. So the forthcoming article that I will discuss today is tentatively titled Imperialism, Not Imperialists, The Good Orientalist and 19th Century German Orientalism. The article expands upon my book's claim that there are three problematic, dominant methodologies in the field of Islamic studies in the West. First, source criticism. Second, the search for Islam's so-called origins. Third, imposing a Protestant Christian notion of religion. So while I advocated in the book that these three methods are significant limitations in late antique and medieval Islamic studies, today I will shift to considering how these methods are actually forms of intellectual imperialism. So let me begin then by offering a brief explanation of intellectual imperialism that builds upon the critique of Orientalism put forward by Edward Said and elaborated by several other scholars. Intellectual imperialism is a scholarly process of erasure and exploitation. It often takes the shape of a vertical rather than a horizontal, horizontal relationship to the subject of study. Much like third world development projects or humanitarian intervention, intellectual imperialism frequently masquerades as a form of assistance, rescue, or reform. Sayyid Hussein al-Atas observes that intellectual imperialists allege that they are, quote, developing the sciences in underdeveloped societies. A key aspect of intellectual imperialism is the denigration and replacement of indigenous methods of knowledge production. Gayarchi Spivak poignantly described the silencing of indigenous knowledge when she asked, can the subaltern speak? Notably, scholarship does not need to be produced within the borders of an imperial center in order to be imperialist. This is why colonized natives can participate in intellectual imperialism as Franz Fanon demonstrated so eloquently. Moreover, in order to evaluate if scholarship is intellectually imperialist, we have to go to the colony and examine that scholarship's implications in a particular field of study. Thus, the biography of an individual scholar is irrelevant to detecting intellectual imperialism. In an interesting way, a recent film exemplifies some of the points I want to emphasize here. Some of you might have seen this problematic film, Victoria and Abdul, or seen the commercials for it. So that film portrays the relationship between Queen Victoria and her servant Abdul as a mutually beneficial and even endearing one. What the film systematically ignores is the brutality and violence of British colonialism in India, or more specifically, the very injustice of Abdul serving Victoria. Just as the film whitewashes British colonialism through its idealized representation of the relationship between Victoria and Abdul, so too does some recent scholarship whitewash intellectual imperialism through its romanticized representation of some German Orientalist scholars. So deromanticizing German Orientalism is one of my objectives today. I will elaborate how source criticism, <coughs> searching for Islam's so-called origins, and projecting the Protestant Christian notion of religion constitute intellectual imperialism in the field of Islamic studies. These are vertical methods of civilizing and controlling the Islamic tradition. To clarify these points, I will use a case study on the scholarship of Ignaz Goldzier. Goldzier was a Hungarian Orientalist who was trained in Germany and often wrote in German. He is commonly viewed as the founder of the German Orientalist School of Islamic Studies, Islamwissenschaft. He was an opponent of the philological Orientalist tradition of his time, and he situated himself against the prevailing scholarly assumptions of his era. Nevertheless, I will demonstrate that Goldzier's scholarship implemented the three aforementioned problematic methods. He adopted source criticism. He searched for Islam's so-called origins, and he imposed a Protestant Christian understanding of religion. These three methods exemplify the intellectual imperialism of Goldzier's scholarship in particular, and 19th century German Orientalism in general. For contemporary scholars in Islamic studies, discussing Goldzier's scholarship may seem unnecessary. Long superseded, Goldzier's work is not as canonical as it once was. And yet Goldzier's methods and the methods of his contemporaries continue 
to shape Islamic studies scholarship today. Moreover, there is a very important lesson in the Goldzier case. Some recent studies portray Goldzier as the so-called good orientalist. These studies allege that Goldzier's identity as Jewish demonstrates that German Christian and German Jewish scholars approached the study of the Orient in distinct ways during the 19th and early 20th centuries. I want to be clear that I oppose the categorization of scholarship based on a scholar's identity. I am compelled to do so in this talk in order to respond to the existing literature which emphasizes scholarly identity, but I myself am totally against it. In addition to pointing to his identity, some scholars have pointed to Goldzier's anti-imperialist sentiments as proof that he was an exceptional figure in 19th century German Orientalism. Yet, as I will illustrate, despite his biography, and even despite his intentions, Goldzier's scholarship was intellectually imperialist. And this point is extremely important and deserves emphasis. A sympathetic identity and good intentions do not prevent intellectual imperialism. <laughs> So let me turn now to a discussion of these three intellectual imperialist methods in Islamic studies in general and in Goldzier's scholarship in particular. The first method is source criticism. 19th century European <coughs> philologists spearheaded the use of source critical techniques. Source criticism consists of comparing surviving textual sources and based on a set of presumed neutral <coughs> principles, identifying which source is older or more authentic in order to construct a so-called original text, an urtext. The first image on the slide is a visual representation of manuscript variants that emanate from a so-called original text. As I elaborated in my book, source criticism is not a method for organizing or evaluating historical sources. Instead, it is a method for constructing an imaginary original text. Among 19th century European scholars of Islam, there was a prevalent assumption that source criticism was a secular and thereby neutral method for authenticating so-called problematic Islamic religious sources. Contrary to their presumptions, however, source critical methods are biased and they are flawed. Moreover, as applied in Islamic studies, source criticism is a form of intellectual imperialism for three simple reasons. First, source criticism entails a vertical rather than horizontal relationship to a text. Second, it purports to reform or to correct a text. And third, it replaces indigenous methods of knowledge production. Goldzier devoted much of his book Muslim Studies to the application of source critical ideas to tradition reports, a hadith. For those who do not know, a basic definition of tradition reports is reports of the sayings or acts of the Prophet Muhammad can get more complicated than that, as Jack, of course, has written about extensively. The second image on the screen is a visual representation of the chain of transmission of a tradition report. It represents the transmitters of tradition reports in vertical linearity, much like textual criticism image above it. Goldzier denied that tradition reports were historical sources. He claimed that they merely reflected the sociopolitical and theological concerns of redactors and transmitters who postdated the historical events that were the content of the tradition reports. This continues to be a prevalent and very problematic notion in the field of Islamic studies. In my book, I elaborate why there is no historiographic basis for this view. The key issue is that even historical sources that are contemporaneous to historical events reflect the sociopolitical and theological concerns of authors and transmitters. In other words, the prevalent 19th century Orientalist idea, which Goldzier shared, that tradition reports are a historical text is not a neutral or scientific assertion about what constitutes a valid or reliable historical source. Instead, the falsification of tradition reports undermines indigenous narrators and sourcers. So when source criticism is applied in Islamic studies, it is often premised on the hierarchical superiority of source critical methods. 19th century European Orientalists perceived source critical methods as scientific and objective as compared to traditional Muslim methods, which they perceived as unscientific and biased. Goldzier depicted traditional hadith science as being inferior to source criticism because he actually misunderstood and discounted indigenous methods in favor of his intellectually imperialist methods. We have extensive evidence that medieval Muslim scholars employed a variety of techniques to evaluate the reliability and authenticity of oral reports based on both the chain of transmission and the text. <coughs> 
In his scholarship, Goldzier misrepresented several aspects of traditional Muslim methods and insisted that, quote, modern historical science, end quote, required scholars not to treat tradition reports as historical sources. Goldzier viewed his methodology as superior to indigenous methods, specifically that of medieval Orthodox Muslim scholars who developed an elaborate and complex science for studying tradition reports. Intellectual imperialism is evident in the presumption that traditional Islamic methods of studying tradition reports are either irrational or inferior. It is important to recognize the power dynamics underlying the scholarly critique of traditional Islamic hadith science. Modern scholars approach textual criticism in ways that simultaneously diverge from and discount the methods of medieval Muslim scholars. While the heuristics and archival practices of late antique and medieval Muslims differed from those of modern scholars, they are just as subjective and just as imperfect. The medieval Muslim scholars who compiled and redacted tradition reports created an archive of oral and written materials. When modern scholars dismiss the products of traditional Islamic hadith science, they effectively dismantle the oral written archive of late antique and medieval Muslim scholars. I contend that source criticism, criticism sorry, is a subalternization of Islamic sources. What that means is first, a linear textual critical analysis modernizes the historical testimony of the tradition report's subaltern narrator. And second, the application of source critical methods erases the medieval Muslim historian, thereby rendering him subaltern. Subaltern theory illuminates that the usage of source critical methods in conventional Islamic studies scholarship does not pursue historiography, but rather silences and manipulates the voices in Islamic historical sources. The second method is searching for Islam's so-called origins. The modern philological method of constructing an original source corresponded to an analogous method of searching for the racial origin of societies. Specifically, comparative philology searched for the origins of races in language, paralleling the notions of race that were prevalent in 19th century imperial and colonial thought, some modern European disciplinary methods classified and analyzed societies in racial terms, particularly Aryan and Semitic. This is why much 19th century European Orientalist scholarship on Islamic history searched for Islam's so-called origins. As I elaborate in my book, the very notion of origins is problematic because it is ahistorical and essentialist. In the context of Islamic studies, the scholarly search for so-called origins and influence is part of a project of discovering a true or authentic Islam. And this project is imperialist because true or original Islam adopts the racialized framework of imperialism. Moreover, searching for origins is a form of intellectual imperialism for three basic reasons. First, searching for origins entails a vertical rather than horizontal relationship to Islamic traditions because it purports to correct or to falsify Islamic traditions by discovering so-called foreign origins. Second, searching for origins imposes an imperialist strategy of sectarianism. And third, searching for origins discounts indigenous knowledge. Scholarly racialization of Islam parallels imperial and colonial projects of racializing and scientifically measuring native populations. Colonial scientists sought to trace human evolution by measuring the skulls and bodies of native populations. These scientists used these measurements to explain the purported backwardness of native populations. Similarly, in Islamic studies, origin scholarship was directed towards an underlying prejudiced objective explaining how Arabs, despite their alleged backwardness, were able to so-called develop Islam by borrowing from more so-called so civilized groups. Goldzier's scholarship engaged in both aspects of origins-oriented studies, alleging the defectiveness of Arabs and speculating on influences or borrowings from other ethnic or racial groups. His scholarship is filled with unfounded and inaccurate allegations about what Arabs must have borrowed from other civilizations. Often confusing the categories of Muslim and Arab, Goldzier, like his Orientalist contemporaries, viewed Arabs as primitive and unoriginal borrowers. Origin scholarship ignores the inherent hybridity of all peoples, espousing a notion of racial purity that is simultaneously impossible and imperialist. 
This is particularly evident in Orientalist scholarship on the origins of Islamic law. The ostensible competition to demonstrate which foreign legal system influenced Islamic law the most is a misleading attempt to measure identity, rather than a productive scholarly practice. In particular, Goldsier's numerous scholarly declarations about the Jewish origins of Islamic law were entirely unsubstantiated and have been refuted by recent scholarship. As I elaborate in my book, pre-Islamic laws became Islamic and fused with new laws in a process that may be likened to a craft, the artwork of Islamic legal recycling. The recycled component parts of Islamic legal artwork are not distinguishable. Moreover, pre-modern Eastern Jewish law and Islamic law often transformed in tandem as they responded to the same socio-political conditions. So in addition to relying on imperialist racial categories, the scholarly discourse on origins, borrowing, and influence reflected an imperialist politics of sectarianism. A sectarian policy of divide and conquer was a crucial and prevalent colonial strategy. By way of example, in Algeria, the French divided Berbers, Arabs, and other groups, often placing them in a colonial hierarchy in order to control the colonized population and to pit the groups against each other. The intellectual imperialist version of sectarianism divides groups into ethnic, racial, or religious subgroups and places these groups in an imperialist hierarchy. So for example, as previously noted, Goldsey repeated the prevalent Orientalist idea that Islam was subject to Jewish and Christian influences. Now this claim of borrowing an influence perpetuates sectarian notions by denying the reality that Arabs or Muslims could also be Jews and Christians in addition to being <coughs> hybrids. So there was such a thing as Arab Jewish Christians or Arab Muslim Jews. Contrary to the sectarianism underlying conventional approaches to Islamic studies, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are not in a simple derivative linear relationship. Instead, during particular historical moments, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam were overlapping traditions, the products of the equivalent sociopolitical and historical conditions. Indeed, the very notion of Abrahamic religions is a problematic imperialist construction that places Judaism, Christianity, and Islam in an imperialist hierarchy. So the third method is searching for uh, original Islam through the Protestant Christian notion of religion. In addition to comparative philology, imperialist racial classifications informed the modern discipline of comparative religion. As Timothy Fitzgerald and other scholars have demonstrated, the category of religion is part of a racialized colonial discourse. Specifically, the Aryan Semite binary became a re secular religious binary in which Semites are portrayed as incapable of being secular. Moreover, the construction of religion as a separate sphere reflects a colonial strategy of control. Colonial governance imposed a separation between secularism and religion in order to dominate native culture. That is, colonial rulers used religious codes and religious courts to manage colonized populations. The colonial introduction of the category of religion in colonized regions was intended to discipline the native population. Likewise, the application of religion as a category of analysis in Islamic studies is a form of intellectual imperialism. Because the category of religion is based on Protestant Christianity, it delegitimizes traditions that do not conform to Protestant Christianity or to post-Christian secularism. First, the dominant Protestant Christian notion of religion negates the fusion of the sacred and the political that was integral to the Islamic tradition. Second, this same notion of religion implicitly compares and evaluates traditions in relation to Protestant Christianity, judging other traditions to be inferior and in need of reform. This is one reason why Orientalist scholars would often claim that there are so-called contradictions between Islamic dogma and Muslim daily life or between Islamic legal theory and legal practice. This notion of contradiction, which continues to reverberate in contemporary Islamic studies, is the unfortunate consequence of adopting a notion of religion that inevitably functions as a civilizing <coughs> mission. This civilizing mission is evident in the scholarly notion of original Islam. Just as archaeologists of the Holy Land disposed of layers of historical materials in order to unearth biblical era remains, intellectual imperialists sought to dispose of layers of Islamic tradition in order to unearth a notion of original Islam. <coughs> 
Like the source critical search for an original text and the comparative philological search for an original language, or spraha, Goldzier searched for an original monotheism in Islam. He was explicit about his search for a true religion. Goldzier wrote about the original Islamic ideal and asserted that, quote, early Muslims were close to the original ideas of Islam, end quote. His scholarship often identified ways in which Muslims seemingly tarnished his mythical notion of original Islam. For instance, Goldzier lamented, quote, the Islamic idea of religion was overgrown and smothered by the casuistry of its lawyers and the scholastic ingenuities of its theologians, end quote. Similarly, he evaluated some Muslim sects as not being authentically Islamic, and Goldzier's notion of an original Islam did not exist, but was rather the construct of his own intellectual imperialism. Goldzier purported to identify for Muslims true Islam and to admonish Muslims for corrupting original Islam with ideology and politics. Because he viewed religion as separable from ideology and politics, his understanding of religious reform reflects Protestant Christian presumptions and a colonial politics of civilizing Muslims. Goldzier's quest for original Islam involved not only attempting to reform Islam generally, but also Islamic law particularly. He claimed that Islamic law was perverted by the legal reasoning of Muslim jurists, which he viewed as ideological. Yet law is an ideological discourse. In contrast, what is referred to as religion in a secular or modern construct is assumed to be separable from politics. So by declaring a need for Islamic legal reform within the alleged gap between theory and praxis, Goldzier demonstrated that he sought to reform Islamic law by making it a religion rather than a legal tradition. In short, Goldzier misunderstood Islamic law as religion instead of law. And put differently, Goldzier wanted to reform Islam so that it would be more like Protestant Christianity. Goldzier's notion of religion corresponded with the presumptions of his Orientalist predecessors and contemporaries. So you might be wondering what alternatives exist to these three methods that I have identified as intellectually imperialist. Fortunately, we are not trapped within either the methods of Goldzier or his Orientalist contemporaries. And this brings us back to my book and particularly to the case studies. First, instead of source criticism, I offer a post-foundationalist understanding of late antique Islamic sources, advocating that they be read critically and in conjunction with each other. My approach is based on horizontality. I am not in the business of correcting or judging Islamic sources. I do not presume to be in a position of authority in relation to any given Islamic historical text. More specifically, many scholars view Islamic historical sources as biased because they label them as religious. I reject both the erroneous historiographic assumptions and intellectual imperialism of characterizing these sources as biased. The characterization of late antique and medieval Islamic sources as problematic, or as is often said in the field, unreliable or unauthentic, is intertwined with an intellectual imperialist objective of denigrating indigenous knowledge and methods. In addition to relinquishing problematic techniques of source criticism, I read all the available historical evidence critically without assigning superiority to any source. In short, I advocate historiography instead of textual studies. And this is particularly ironic because my book just won an award for the American Academy of Religion in the category of textual studies. But Congratulations. Thanks, but yeah, Thank it's, it's kind of a funny thing. <laughs> So while I implement alternatives to source criticism in all the case studies of the book, my approach is particularly evident in the first case study. Using a variety of sources that are conventionally dismissed as folklore, I identify a historical distinction between late antique and medieval juristic ideas about the treatment of war prisoners. In particular, I argue that most late antique jurists prohibited the execution of war prisoners, while their medieval counterparts did not. I propose that this shift in juristic opinions is related to changes in how jurists perceived historical precedents. Thus, by reading biography, tradition reports, and exegesis horizontally, I offer a critical demonstration of tracing legal historical change. Second, instead of searching for origins, I recognize that Islam simply began in late antiquity and constituted a fusion of the late antique world in which it began. The Islamic tradition does not have a tangible origin or evolution. There are only shifts and transformations in Islamic practices within concrete Muslim communities. Reflecting the methodology of comparative philology, 
Common presumptions of linear derivation are based on mistaken assumptions about the purity of either identity or law. By way of example, Islamic and Jewish legal systems did not borrow from each other, but rather occupied the same socio-historical space and in some cases responded similarly to a shared context. The shared Islamicate context, rather than essential features of Islamic or Jewish jurisprudence, clarifies whatever resemblances there may be between the two legal traditions. In a case study in the book on wife-initiated divorce, I illustrate that Jews and Muslims shared an Islamicate legal culture. Consequently, Jewish and Islamic regulations of wife-initiated divorce changed in similar ways, as both traditions placed more limitations on a wife's ability to initiate a divorce for a variety of reasons that I explain in the book. Another case study that delves into Islamicate legal traditions concerns circumcision. In that chapter, I argued against assuming a genealogical or linear relationship between Jewish and Islamic circumcision. Muslims did not simply borrow circumcision from Jews. Instead, circumcision was widely practiced in the Near East and for dissimilar reasons. Muslims fused a variety of regional traditions and created a hybrid and fluid practice. So whereas for late antique Jews, circumcision was obligatory, ritualized, and representative of the divine covenant, for Muslims, it was not obligatory, not ritualized, and tied to cleanliness or purity. So instead of borrowing, the case of circumcision illustrates the Islamicate pastiche that occurred as Islamic law assimilated the diverse Near Eastern customary practices of male circumcision. Finally, instead of imposing an externally derived and developed category of religion, I advocate that we recognize Islam as a multifaceted, pluralistic, and fluctuating tradition. A tradition is a changing array of ideas and practices shared by groups over time. I elaborated the importance of relinquishing the category of religion in a piece on the charity tax, which was published in Islamic Law and Society. In late antiquity, being Muslim was a form of citizenship. Indeed, belief is only one component of Muslim identity, and we cannot presume that it is either a universal or an essential component of Muslim identity. The attempt to reform or to judge Islam through the notion of religion and its separation of the sacred and the political is then deeply problematic. So as I noted when I began, Muslim jurists were like artists who used a combination of recycled and new materials, crafting their legal opinions by fusing ancient norms, scripture, prophetic precedents, local practice, and contemporaneous needs in unexpected ways. The craft of legal recycling produced works whose component parts are not easily identifiable or classifiable. Much law was simultaneously Islamic and tribal, Jewish or customary. Rather than labeling a law's presumed identity, each of the three case studies in my book illustrates instead the recycled art of Islamic jurisprudence. To identify intellectual imperialism, our scholarly models must be assessed for coherence and, preci and precision, not intentions or identity. Thank you all for listening.